Okay. I hope you can all see this, the screen. Um, first of all, thank you all for, uh, for joining us today for our Reproducibility for Everyone workshop. Um, it's really nice to see so many of you tune in from really all corners of the world uh, and to see so much enthusiasm for discovering strategies to uh, increase reproducibility of your own and other uh, people's research. Um, I wanted to start by introducing myself. So Lenny, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, my name is Nela Halterman. Um, and I'm a member of the uh, steering committee of GSA's Early Career Leadership uh, Program. Um, I'm also an eLife Community Ambassador, and through this program, I uh, became involved in an initiative that focuses on uh, increasing reproducibility of research. So in a few minutes, Lenny will tell you a bit more about the background of this project and where it all started. Um, but the main goal of this project is to develop educational materials like the workshop that you are um, attending now, um, that train researchers um, in the best practices for rigor and reproducibility, and to make them aware of tools that they can use to improve the reproducibility of their work. Um, as I got involved in this initiative, I realized that there are really a lot of valuable lessons to learn here, and that actually about the most of them, I, I really had no clue. Um, so I hope that you will all have a similar feeling at the end of this workshop. Um, and I wanted to share the lessons I learned and to amplify the reproducibility message among my fellow genetic enthusiasts. So I thought, what better way to reach GSA's entire community than by trying to get the chance to host a workshop at THUC, where really all um, research communities are um, gathered under one big roof. We had the corona crisis happen in the meantime, and that actually turned our roof into a virtual roof, but um, it gave us a unique chance to really reach an even larger audience. Uh, so we are really excited to see that you all showed up in, uh, in such high numbers. Um, Lenny, could you, yeah, okay, this slide. Um, so uh, we sent you all um, um, on a survey a couple of days ago, and many of you answered uh, quite quickly. We got almost 200 people responding. Uh, and one of the questions that we asked was what your favorite model organism is. And as you can see um, from all of your responses, we really have scientists from all of GSA's uh, research communities joining us today. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. I think this is really, um, really awesome. Um, GSA really unifies many different research communities that each study their own favorite model organism, but we all share a passion for genetics. And apparently we really all um, share a passion for uh, reproducibility in science as well. So we are very grateful to the GSA for giving us this opportunity to host our reproducibility workshop. Um, and we hope that you will all enjoy the workshop. And with that, I'll um, pass it on to Lenny. Thank you, Naila. And uh, Naila is just the perfect example of what we're hoping for in the long run, why we started the Reproducibility for Everyone initiative that this is uh, part of. And uh, as Naila said, I'm Lenny. I'm the co-founder and CEO of protocols.io. And uh, for the introduction, I want to talk a little bit about just the background of this initiative. The website is reproducibilityforeveryone.org. You can see it on this slide. And Naila is a perfect example, as I said, of what we're hoping for, which is not just to talk to you about the tools, but to really arm you with uh, the resources and tools and to put you in position of leading these kinds of workshops yourself. So by the end of this, you will be certified reproducibility workshop leaders. Um, and a lot of people that over the last two years have gone through these uh, workshops uh, in person at conferences or online, um, a lot of them end up then doing it for their lab, for their department. So this is not something we are making money on. This is a volunteer effort. And um, it really got started through a collaboration between eLife ambassadors, AdGene, <coughs> AdGene Protocols IO, and April, who is uh, co-leading this and is going to be covering some of the sections going forward. April and I, um, when she was still at Code Ocean, which is uh, one of the organizations that also helped to co-found this, uh, we ran together with AdGene and Code Ocean. We ran 
uh, before this initiative existed as, a, as an explicit group, we ran a reproducibility workshop at uh, Caltech. And from there came the idea of creating, uh, creating this kind of workshop module for conferences and running it at conferences because you have the same people, you know which tools they need, you can adjust the workshops. It's not just physicists and geneticists coming at a given university, but uh, conferences are a really great uh, venue for presenting these tools and resources. A few years ago is when we had the idea and um, eLife ambassadors, people from Adgene, people from protocols.io put a lot of effort over a period of a year into creating the content. So there are many, many people that worked on this. You can see all of them at the website, brickprobeforeveryone.org. We invite you to join the community. This is ever evolving. We want more volunteers. We want more people running this. Um, all of this is available open access. If you go to the website, all of the slides, these slides here that we're presenting, um, you can see in the beginning we mentioned, in the beginning we mentioned that the slides are available as well. Um, so we'll share that at the end and we'll have we have notes and we have handouts um, all of this is open all of this is something that you can take modify and uh, present to others and on a personal note i want to join Nayla in thanking the genetic side of america personally for me um, th this is uh, particularly particularly a wonderful moment to be presenting it through the GSA because Genetic Society of America was the first academic society that I joined as a young graduate student in 2003. I went annually to their yeast genetics meetings. Uh, GSA was the first society to partner with protocols that I own, supported us from day one of the company. They were the first publisher to include protocols I own in author guidelines. Now there's over 500 journals doing that, but they were really the first. And they're the first hosting this huge uh, webinar, uh, not the first for doing it at a conference uh, that started just a year and a half ago with ASPB being the first one, but the first one to have such a huge online workshop. Um, and it really is for me personally, just a huge pleasure. And I'm very grateful for the GSA for hosting this. And to finish the acknowledgements really quickly, I really, need to give a shout out to Benjamin Schwesinger, who is a scientist in Australia. And uh, he was the eLife ambassador that um, I mentioned to that it would be wonderful if we could start, if we could start something like this at conferences. And as I said, we worked as a group from different organizations, lots of different scientists contributing to the content. But Benjamin was really the driving force, keeping this on track, making sure that we create the content, we start doing these workshops at conferences. This wouldn't exist without him. And um, I am just very, very grateful for his leadership over years um, on, on this. And uh, he, he's personally done many of these. So that's the background. And uh, with that, let's go very quickly before we get into the tools and resources themselves let's just talk a little bit about reproducibility what we mean by it and some of your responses so as Nayla said we did ask you to fill out a survey many of you did um, we got 188 responses at the point where we were processing it um, a day or two ago and we asked you one of the questions we asked was have you ever had problems reproducing your own or someone else's research and you can see uh, most people it's not just my own research which was 12 percent 30 percent said someone else's and 50 percent of people had trouble reproducing both right then there is every time we run the survey there's a few lucky ones uh, who have never had problems reproducing research or they're just starting out in their research career and it's simply a function of time before that happens um, but obviously this is something that's very common there's a reason why so many of you are on this workshop and uh, we have specific goals we have specific goals um, for what you know what what is our 
theme and uh, what are we trying to get across uh, with this uh, workshop. So um, we'll talk a little bit about just the definition of reproducibility to get everyone on the same page and what are the different barriers, but we have a theme of what we want you to take away from this. And it's not to talk just about too many problems and it's not to point fingers, but this really should be actionable and something that uh, you can use in your daily research. And the sections that we'll cover after the introduction will go through the as you get started for documenting as you're doing the work, as you've started on the project, analyzing, and then finally tools for, uh, that help you with disseminating your research. And when, um, when we talk about reproducibility, I think many of us use it colloquially, but there are actually differences when, you, uh, when, when we dig into to the definition of the terms, there are differences between reproducibility and replication, right? So reproducible research, you provide all the tools for others to repeat uh, your work. Replication is when people use the same methods, but on their data, on their organisms, right? And there is a sort of matrix uh, from this paper from Pat Schloss um, that I think actually he took from uh, Kirsty Whitaker. And there's a matrix that reproducibility, at least for computational biologists, is really about using the same methods on the same experimental system. Replicability is when you're using the same methods, but you're starting a different organism, different system. If you're using different methods, that's robustness. And of course, uh, over time, something we all hope for with any research that we do is that in different organisms and with different methods, people would get to the same conclusions and the same discoveries that we see, and that's uh, generalizability. So we will be focusing this specific workshop on reproducibility. So, which is basically, can you yourself repeat your work in a year, right? Um, and before we do that, um, I want to do a little bit of interactive conversation. So obviously, reproducibility is not all that matters for rigorous research. And without with, without um, over-focusing and getting stuck on re reproducibility or replicability, when we talk more generally, right, um, obviously there are all these different components that feed into what gives us rigorous research, right, the honesty and are we using statistics correctly. And so um, we are not going to tackle all of these, right, um, but we're just hoping to do an easy start with things that you can use today, no matter which phase of the research cycle you're in. And before we get started with the overview of the tools themselves, um, if you can open the chat, um, I wonder if you can put in a few things that in the general sense, whether it's generalizability, robustness, replicability, or reproducibility, what are some of the things that make it hard to repeat other people's work? And just uh, to see the discussion here are some of the general areas that make it difficult. So uh, let's see if we can look at the chat. I don't know if you can see the chat on my screen. Um, and people started, this is fantastic. So people started uh, just putting in what are the re what are the things that make it hard, um, and you can see in the chat, you can see bad note keeping, human factors, vague description of methods, right? Materials and method sections leaving out steps, biological variability, lack of detail. So that's again that record keeping, disorganized work, bad notes, insufficient materials and methods, bad documentation. Um, and there are more and more things coming in. Some of them are provenance is a general problem, lack of code, right? Can you see what people have done? Um, obviously, oh, incentives 
to rush to data. So incentives are a big one. There are lots of things and um, this is fantastic. Thank you folks for brainstorming in the chat. And that's exactly what we want to get across with this slide that there are a lot of things that make it hard. Right? And as we keep going in these different sections, you can see, right, there's statistics, there's p-hacking, rewards and incentives, as some of you are saying in the chat, poor sharing of reagents, methods, data, poor design, um, pressure, right, hyper-competition, pressure to publish, fraud, right, the intellectual honesty that we talked about. So there are many, many things that make it hard. Um, which is a little bit of depressing, this exercise, what we're doing in the chat and what you're seeing here is a little bit depressing, but there is good news. And the good news is that I personally don't think, and those of us who are working on this reproducibility for everyone initiative, we don't think that this is really a new problem. Right? If you look a lot of the things that we have in the chat and on this slide, there is all the science itself. It was never trivial to repeat what uh, someone did. Um, the good news is we actually, there is something that is new and that's not the challenge of reproducibility. What is new is the fact that we have a lot of tools and best practices and resources that we didn't have 30, 50 or 100 years ago. And so that really is what this workshop is about. And I love the quote from an amazing geneticist and neuroscientist, Corey Bargman. Um, who said 82 years ago, she said this two years ago, so, so she was talking about the uh, end of the century. She said 82 years ago, there were no antibiotics. We didn't know that smoking causes lung cancer and many other things. We can expect a lot from the next 82 years. Right? And so despite all of the problems, we know that science works, right? It's been working as imperfect as it is with all of our warts and uh, issues that we just talked about on the previous slide, there, there is no controversy around the fact that science does work. And the point of this workshop is not to blame each other and say funders need to do more, publishers need to do more. There are many people involved in uh, improving what each individual entity expects and does to improve reproducibility. But the point here is, while we know that science works, as Corey said, and that's really the point of the quote, if we've made this much progress in the last 82 years, where can we be in the next 82 if we accelerate science? Right? And so that's the guiding principle of this entire workshop. What are simple things we individually as researchers can do? What are steps we can take um, that just make our work a little bit faster? And when we publish, make it a little bit more useful and accelerate the progress. Right? And in terms of what are the things, the potential for growth, this was part of the survey. Um, it sort of reflects what was just coming up in the chat. Uh, what are the improvements that could lead to more reproducibility? A lot of you said that uh, better and more detailed methods and record keeping. So that's not just in publishing, right? More publicly available data and metadata, increased statistical power in experiments, less pressure to publish, fewer incentives to be first rather than right, better reagent sharing, better code sharing. We won't touch in all of these. We can't fix the pressure to publish and the incentives in this workshop, but there are things that are under our control and that's what we'll be focusing on in this workshop. And the reason, the reason we called it reproducibility for everyone is because it's not just aimed at 10 years down the road, someone reading your paper and making your paper more reproducible for somebody else. It's for everyone, meaning including you. And the quote that I love about this is, your most likely collaborator in six months is yourself, right? So the, most of the tools and resources we touch on in this workshop are really around making your life easier 
making sure that you can repeat your work, making sure that you don't waste time, making sure that once you publish, you spend less time answering questions and digging through pages of notes um, or dealing with crises and that you get fewer questions because you've shared things properly. And so those are the tools we'll focus on. A lot of them are really simple things that are actually quite powerful and you'll see in the next section in just a second. And keep in mind that we will go over many tools. You don't need to vigorously scribble notes. We have a handout that we link to um, with all of the, basically all of the resources and then some that we mentioned shared there. We will go over many resources and tools. Don't try to adopt all of them. Don't try to be perfect. Just start somewhere, improve one, two, maybe three things that you're doing, right? And this is a lifelong journey. None of us are perfect, but every single step helps, right? So uh, as I said, this is reproducibility for everyone. And most importantly, you individually, um, both in the short and long term. So with that, um, let's go into data management. And I forgot to mention, I was going to have April talk a little bit. At the bottom of every slide, you can see the link to shared notes. So chat is, uh, chat is great uh, in Zoom but we also have shared notes you can see what are the sections we are covering all the important links to both these slides to the reproducibility initiative and to the handout are in those notes so uh, bit.ly slash tagc dash notes you can open that up that's a google doc you can ask questions there you can put comments in so um, try to try to not forget about that as well and that's where you have the access to all of the tools and resources uh, the links to them that we mentioned and these slides themselves so you can build on them take them present them um, and slice and dice them as you need to so with that let's get started on data management um, and that's really really first step of the work that you're doing right so before you've started the experiments um, usually when we're doing this in person we ask how many of you go through a data management plan before you get started. And what you're trying, most people do not. Um, I think someone unmuted. Is there a question or something in the chat that I should see? Oh, people are asking about saving the chat. Um, okay. I'll keep going, but one of the other co-hosts of this, if there's something that I'm missing or you suddenly can't see my screen, please unmute yourself and let me know. Um, but the data management part is really not about publishing. This is about, as you're doing the work, avoiding what you see on this slide, right? Just the organization finding the version, finding the files that you need. Um, and one great way to avoid the headaches that we all deal with when it comes to data management is to have a plan before you get started. So there are some funders that ask you or require you to have a data management plan. If your funder doesn't ask for it, take a look at the DMP tool. Uh, it's a free tool from uh, run by the CDL, California Digital Library uh, in Oakland, California. You don't need your funder to ask you for it. You can look at some of the templates, what NSF asks for, and just create a plan um, for where you'll have the data, how you'll name it, what the directory structure will be. And it's this is one of those really trivial, simple things. Uh, at the bottom of the slide are more detailed guides, but if before you get started, you think about what you'll be collecting, how you'll organize it, right? Who's going to be responsible for it? And what do you need to track around your samples, around the work, what's the metadata? If you think about it, where it will live, what the organization is, and make that plan before you get started, over the next five years of research, um, you will be continuously thanking yourself for doing that. 
And here are some really simple tips, right? Um, for how to organize your actual directory and where you keep the readme and the links. We always emphasize um, not just how to organize it, but we always emphasize the raw data that will be on the next slide. And you can see raw data here, analysis. So try to create structure. Uh, takes an extra couple of minutes to create these directories, but it's hard to do it on the fly as the months are going by. If you think through, if you adopt something like this as you're getting started with a new project, that will make your life easier, right? Breaking down by the year of work. So feel free to just take it. And again, it's a few extra minutes of thinking through how you'll organize it, but massive benefit through the years of doing the work itself. We can't emphasize this enough. We all know we need to keep our raw data. We all know we need to back it up. Um, the recommendation is really back it up three times in different places on your personal computer, on the cloud, and we all ignore it. And if I were to ask you to raise your hand, um, how many of you know someone or have yourselves um, had an accident where you've lost data? A lot of hands go up. And just as encountering problems and difficulties with reproducibility, it's only a function of time before it happens to you. So if today, 5 or 10% of you were to raise your hand in response to how many of you have lost data, just give it enough time and that fraction goes up for the people in the same room, right? Um, and that's, that's an obvious thing, but we always underscore it with the raw data. And a similar thing is the file naming conventions. This is a great PhD comic, right? We've all done the uh, final, final, dot, final, dot, 22 uh, for our files. Uh, again, guide for avoiding this and uh, planning to do it better. And one, one of the things we do in this workshop that is often the favorite of people when we do the post-workshop survey is how to avoid this, right? Like what's a good way of naming your files. Um, you don't need a specific tool. You don't need to go to any website. It's just thinking about the file naming conventions. And, and these are the tips, right? So including the month, meaningful abbreviations, group identifiers, and consistency. And more specifically, Here's a suggestion for long file names that yes, every time you create a file, if you follow this, um, will take you an extra 10 seconds to create the file name. But if you embed the date, project name, experiment type ID and version into the file name, right? again, it's that really simple thing to do that takes just a tiny bit longer. We're talking seconds for every file that you create and then can save you minutes, hours, or days of looking or redoing something because you can't find that and you can't search for it easily on your MacBook or PC. With that, I'll stop with data management and give it over to Angela. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Lenny. Hi, everyone. My name is Angela Abitua, and I'm an outreach scientist at AdGene. Um, we're a nonprofit plasmid repository. And um, I've been a part of this um, initiative, the reproducibility, reproducibility for Everyone initiative, for the past couple of years. And it's been so great to be a part of it um, and to help run these workshops and to see other workshops pop up. Um, so, uh, Lenny, if you can um, switch to the next slide. So um, today I'm going to cover electronic lab notebooks and, um, you know, in terms of uh, the, the um, research process, um, lab notebooks are really important because you're, uh, you know, recording, um, you know, how you, you know, planned out experiments and also it's in many cases one of the first times that you will um, record your observations. And uh, paper lab notebooks uh, have been around for a very long time. They've been in use since the 15th century. And so you can see the image uh, to the right of um, one of Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks. Um, 
And, you know, again, good record keeping is very important for dissemination of the ideas and findings. It can also be a legally binding record, but um, I think most importantly, it's to help you stay organized and to keep track of all the experiments you've done um, and, um, you know, have a safe place to uh, have those initial observations stored. But there are many disadvantages to um, the old fashioned paper lab notebooks, um, such as they're not searchable. Um, if they're made out of paper, they can catch on fire. They can be easily damaged, misplaced, not easy to back up. Um, and then it's also hard to share with collaborators if um, you know, they're not in your lab, like if they're in another country. Next slide, please. And so um, there are many benefits to using electronic lab notebooks. Um, and one of my favorites is that it's searchable. So when I first started um, out in the lab, I had uh, you know, used an old fashioned paper lab notebook. Um, and you know, I keep all of my records uh, in chronological order. But then I started becoming I started, I became frustrated at certain points when I wanted to search for a key experiment. And, you know, you can't really do that with a paper lab notebook. Um, so one of the big benefits is that it's searchable. Um, you can also um, export it um, and store it as data. Um, and so you can, you know, export it as a PDF. And again, remember that when you're dealing with data, you're going to want to, uh, you know, back it up regularly and three times if possible. Uh, and then um, another thing that I really like about electronic lab notebooks is that they're easily easily shareable with collaborators. Um, so for me, this was really helpful um, because after I finished my PhD and moved on, um, I eventually was I was able to transfer all of my initial notes into an electronic lab notebook. And one of my former lab mem members had reached out to me and asked about a specific um, you know experiment that I had run. And you know, thank goodness I had access to this electronic lab notebook because I was able to like, first of all, easily search for what I needed and then share that with um, my uh, former lab mate. And um, you know, and also if if they had my my lab notebooks were still um, back at the lab, but I, I wouldn't want them to have to go through the trouble of searching through my entire lab notebook, especially since my handwriting is only really legible by me. So. Make electronic lab notebooks can help you easily share the information. You can also embed high resolution images, protocols, and more. And uh, also, it can um, improve the access to all of your notes that you've made. So, especially in times like these where maybe you don't currently have access to your lab, um, it's really nice to be able to just, you know, go online and um, have access to your to your uh, lab notes, even if you don't have access physically to your lab. Um, and um, also, uh, you know, some of these electronic lab notebooks have the ability to, you know, if you're, in, if you're, if you, you'd like to use your phone in, in the lab, but there's also some mobile apps that allow you to quickly upload the images. And, so some cost considerations to take for, you know, finding um, the lab notebook, electronic lab notebook that works best for you is there are paid for versions. Um, there are also um, free versions that have upgraded paid versions that exist, um, such as Sino and Benchling. Um, there are also open source versions like open wetware and e-log. And then there are also free versions like Open Science Framework, um, OSF.io, you can check that out. Um, and uh, if you wanna you know, learn more about that, you can look at the link in the previous slide. Um, but one thing that we really um, encourage you to do is, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Like, so not, not you know, there's no perfect electronic lab notebook for for one researcher. Um, so we really encourage you to check out this link, um, this data management um, that H HMS at harvard.edu. And so this is a really great resource that was put together by the Harvard Medical School. And it's basically a matrix of several different um, 
electronic lab notebooks and you get to you know look at it um, and th there's several parameters that you can consider like such as you know I mean, we just talked about um, pricing but the, also like interactivity um, the uh, storage capabilities so we, we highly encourage you to take a look at this and um, you know feel free to in the either the chat or in the notes to share like which which electronic lab notebook um, you've used in the past or are currently using that you really like um, because again there's a lot out there and um, one size doesn't fit all and so here's just a uh, an image of some of the basic features that an electronic lab notebook can provide you so over on the left hand corner you can you know this is showing that you can easily share with other lab mates or other collaborators in the bottom left hand corner you can see uh, that you know traditionally the lab paper lab notebooks are organized in a chronological order but you can also organize it in any other way that you want um, such as you know by different projects or experiments um, and then you know another one of the my favorite things about electronic lab notes notebooks is that you can search by a keyword or date uh, you can add attachments so pictures of your gels um, you can print and easily share um, and uh, you know it's it's just it's just a really nice way to organize. It really helps you to organize all of your records. Next slide, please. And so some general tips specifically for um, good um, electronic record keeping is since it's in the form of data, you're going to want to back it up regularly. Um, we really highly encourage that. It's really important. Um, and to, um, you know, especially if you if you're working in the lab, like doing wet lab work, uh, we all know that it can get messy. And so, you know, having your laptop on your lab bench and like recording directly onto your uh, electronic lab notebook might not be compatible with the type of work you do. So uh, in some cases, you might actually want to maintain a physical um, lab notebook in parallel and then record it afterwards. I, I realize that that can sometimes take a little bit more time, but in the long run, you'll be really happy that you did this because then you can easily search through your your records and share it with other lab members or collaborators and again like i had mentioned before that you know some people i think have started using um elns or electronic lab notebooks that have um, mobile apps so they can use that's a little more portable in the lab and another thing to consider is if you're using a free electronic lab notebook check the privacy and data ownership policies Thank you, Angela. And uh, while Angela was presenting, there were some really good comments in the chat. There are probably some also good comments in the notes, the bit.ly slash THC slash uh, dash notes. Um, some of these, some of these, um, Angela already touched on the questions that were asked. Uh, there was a question about security and stability so those are all things to consider for lab notebooks but uh don't forget about the chat there's really good conversations happening if we don't forget we will try to make sure we save the chat at the end of this and include a link to it in um in the notes uh, so you can access it after the uh, workshop but some really good questions and comments coming in there also in my section on data management just about differences between linux and windows some of this feedback that we're getting in the chat and that you if you uh, are able to share at the end of the workshop in the post workshop survey we'll mention or just in the notes really helpful for us because as i said in the beginning this is an ongoing effort we ran the first workshop uh, almost two years ago but we're continuing to improve we're continuing to add new tools we're continuing to make it clear better so all that feedback what's happening in the chat is super valuable for us and with that we'll move on 
to the section on organizing and sharing protocols. And here's a really common experience. This is a tweet from Morgan Helen, who's a postdoc at UC Riverside, who said, I'm looking for a protocol in 97 paper, as described in 96, finds 96 paper, as described in 87, finds 87 paper, paywall. And when we do this in person, a lot of heads are nodding in uh, vigorous agreement. It's a common and frustrating experience. Uh, this is from a biologist. It's not limited to biology. Here's a physicist. Devices were fabricated as previously described, previously described, previously described. And the original paper says devices were fabricated with conventional methods, right? So good luck figuring out what was done. Um, this section is around how to organize and disseminate, right? So those are the documentation and dissemination of your methods. But the same problem that plagues the papers that we publish, trying to find the details, it also plagues our own internal labs and groups where we keep things on inside our notebooks or on pieces of paper that are floating around. And it can be sometimes very tricky to figure out what exactly we did um, after we finish. My favorite blog post on this uh, is from a professor in Canada, Timothy Paiso, uh, who wrote this blog post where uh, he said that our method sections are often like this analogy of step one, how to draw an owl, draw two circles, step two, fill in the rest of the owl. And he said our method sections are uh, basically along the lines of, we draw the owl on 60.2 GSM white paper of the A4 dimension using 3H and 6B graphite pencils from Cumbria, UK. We did so by looking at owls and drawing what we saw on paper. This protocol yielded one drawn owl. So what we talk about in this section is what to do on a daily basis five years before you're ready to publish your work that will help you keep organized, will reduce the errors as you're doing the work, and then make your life easier when you are publishing and sharing that. Um, quick note on the publishing side is there is a shift uh, among many different publishers. Um, as I said, GSA was the first one to explicitly start recommending that you put detailed protocols in a repository like Protocols.io, not as a supplementary file. And there is a recent from uh, less than a year ago, there is an article in The Scientist, the push to replace journal supplements with repositories. And there are many reasons to do this. Um, so I, I, uh, you, can, you can find this article. I won't go through all of the reasons, um, but there are many reasons not to just upload a PDF as a supplement. That's better than just a method section, which is a vague description, as we saw before. Uh, it's better if you include that PDF as a supplementary file. But the best practice is to use a repository. Um, or it, you, know, you can share on GitHub. You can share on Protocol Exchange on protocols.io. But you can put it up on Zenodo. Um, April, I think, later on, we'll be talking about data sharing repositories. You can put a protocol up there. But it's better to have these up in repositories rather than supplement files. And one of the benefits of uh, adding, adding your protocols to a common knowledge base like protocols IO uh, is in this example, this is one of my favorite illustrations. So here's uh, Alejandro, a researcher from Chile, who asked, uh, does anybody have a protocol uh, for getting RNA out of primary cortical neuron cultures? And Elena, postdoc from UCSF, said, oh, I'd say from those on protocols IO, there were five or six variants of it. I would use the trisal extraction. And she linked, like, this is the one that should work. And what I love about this example is that if you look at the protocol itself, it turns out that it actually accompanies a giga science paper on parasites of stickleback fish, right? So it has nothing to do with cortical neuron cultures. But because the authors of this paper put the protocol into a repository, linked to it from the method section, not only did they make their paper more rigorous and reproducible, but they've put it into a knowledge base where other people can find that, right? Um, so it becomes discoverable. Alejandro would not 
be reading this paper and finding the supplementary file um, accompanying this paper if they hadn't put it into a repository. So there are reasons to do that. Um, and now we'll talk about not just the publishing side, but we'll talk about just what are some of the best practices for keeping track, organizing the protocols, which tools, and what to keep in mind when you write up the protocols and document them. And this is a long workshop. So this is usually the part where we uh, have a hands-on exercise and we are going to try that here too. I'm going to ask you, so for the next five minutes, uh, this is, you can either use it as a bathroom break, but hopefully you stick around, take a piece of paper and try to follow the pro protocol on the next uh, slide, on this slide. So we have a set of instructions. We're going to spend the next three, four minutes just taking a piece of paper and following the steps one through nine in here to see if um, you can reproduce what we have in mind. And uh, this is an exercise that was designed by Anita, our director of outreach on the Protocols IO team. It's fun to do it in person, but I think we can do it virtually as well. So don't give away what this is for the overachievers out there. Don't give away what this is if you figure it out. But if you can spend the next three minutes, go through these steps, try to reproduce it, then go to the chat and simply say, I got it. I think I got it. Pretty sure I got it. Or I have no idea what this is. Um, and we're not grading you on this. We're not going to ask you to screen share and tell us if you got it or not. So uh, no pressure, but if you can put into the chat whether you got it or not, um, that would be wonderful. As you're trying to follow the instructions, as you're trying to follow the instructions, I should say that uh, when I tried it, I did not get very close. And uh, when we were debugging this and seeing what should the instructions say and uh, is this possible at all, I asked my spouse to do this. She got to, I think, step four and that got so frustrated that she threw the notebook that she was sketching on across the room. Please don't throw anything. Don't get frustrated. My point is that this is not trivial to do and I am going to now just let you focus on trying to reproduce it and go into the chat to see if anyone has figured it out. So if you think you got it and you know what we're asking you to draw, um, just type into the chat. One response is, oh my God, no idea how to draw that, which is a common one. Somebody else, yep, I'm lost, no idea. Well, we have, um, let's give it another minute. If you try to just go through the steps, could not get it. <laughs> what is a tenth of an oval? Someone said it's scary, but funny looking. Face of some sort. I finished it, but what? Uh, someone said, think, I got it, but it's the ugliest representation that I've ever seen, if I'm right. Drew a robot of some sort. I think I got it. Got it. I think I've got it. Really confusing. Amoeba? Not an artist, but I think I've got it. So what you're seeing here, robot face, what you're seeing here is exactly what we see when we do it in person. <laughs> Googling to confirm. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's hysterical looking at the chat. Um, some people are saying, how did you get it? I have no idea. So here is uh, what we've collected when we've been running it in person. Um, and you, you know, this is from people that were actually able to complete and follow steps one through nine. And someone just said, it's SpongeBob. Yes, uh, that person guessed it. <laughs> this is the original. The steps one through nine were instructions for recreating what is in the center. And you can see that some people get close, some people did figure out it's SpongeBob. Um, those are not perfect instructions. Uh, some people are really surprised. Oh my God, I was right. Um, 
<laughs> Someone said, I love everything about it. We are not doing this exercise simply to uh, get a laugh, although I found this hysterical right now. Uh, I'm going to close the chat or I'll keep laughing through the recording. Um, the reason we're doing it is to illustrate how hard it is to write protocols, right? So whatever tools you pick, whatever you're using, whether it's paper, hopefully you're using an online tool or Microsoft Word, and hopefully it's not Microsoft Word, um, but if you're using Google Docs, GitHub, Protocols, IO, whatever tool you're using, the tool itself will not make the instructions automatically clear and easy for someone to follow. And so this exercise, what you can see right away is if you look at what we got through these steps one through nine, if you look at the outputs we got, you instantly recognize that we missed some key precision in the instructions. And looking at how some people invert, right, and the vertical orientation of some of the things, you instantly know what you would do in version two of that set of instructions. So based on how we've run it before, we haven't improved it so that we can still do the exercise, but looking at what people are doing, you quickly know what you should improve. And so keeping a record of your protocol is the first step, but then thinking about when you're going to be giving it to your lab mates or when you'll be publishing it, how do I make it clear for others? And there is no way to get it perfect. It's an iterative process, right? It will take time. You need to see what happens in the hands of other people as they follow your protocol. There will be questions over time, people in your lab trying to reproduce, people outside, right? And so our advice is um, we have more in the links here uh, in terms of the art of writing good methods, right? So we have sort of guidelines uh, and suggestions, but the brief summary is you should think of a protocol as a brief, modular, self-contained scientific publication. The method section is sort of an abstract for what you've done. The protocol is the publication for that abstract, right? Um, you should put in abstracts so that people know why and what this method is for. And what you want in terms of precision is to capture not just what you've done, but to capture the amounts, the vendor names, the lot of the antibody. There's a lot to think about what you're trying to capture. Forget about people reading your paper for yourself when you run out of the antibody. When you come back to this project in half a year, where did you order it from? Right? Why is it not working now? So try to capture these things in the protocol itself, right? the safety, the chronology of steps. And what we're illustrating with the drawing exercise is that this is an iterative process. It needs versioning. So if you're using Microsoft Word or paper, it's going to be really hard to get feedback. You'll be rewriting the protocol. So use, whether it's an ELN or Google Docs or Protocols IO, use something that makes versioning easy because you will get questions. There will be confusion. Right? You will be improving it for yourself, and then you'll be improving it for others in or out of your lab. Um, so these are just some things to keep in mind. Um, but the bottom line is it's hard. Don't try to make it perfect. Choose a tool. Make sure there is versioning. Try to include all the details. And try to think of the person who is looking at it who is not you and hasn't been using this protocol for the last three weeks. Um, how will they read through it? So with that, I'll give it over to Angela again. Thanks, Lenny. Um, so I will be covering wet lab reagent sharing. And many of you uh, are working with organisms or also with reagents and you know one way to speed up the research process is to be able to um, easily share the, the things that you make in your lab with other researchers but there are many problems that you can run into with sharing these reagents um, so one such scenario that you might run into or some of may some of you may have run into this is that let's say that we have a scientist that makes and uh, publishes a reagent and then you know, slaps on the standard available upon request statement in their article. And 
um, you know, several months later, the scientist leaves the lab and stores that published reagent somewhere in the freezer. Um, and um, then down the line, um, a researcher reads that uh, paper and they realize, oh, they but then they find out that the scientists had left and then they spend time trying to contact the, um, you know, remaining lab members. Uh, only to find out that you know none of the no one else that is still in the lab remembers where that that uh, reagent is stored. Um, so this is this is a problem, and uh, this is a problem that is associated with the traditional way of sharing reagents. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so since uh, you know some of you are many of you are working with organisms, I wanted to highlight an example um, relating to the sharing of research research organisms. So in 2005, the NIH, um, the NIH did a study where they looked at um, several published um, studies that use mouse, mouse lines. And what they found was that approximately half of these mouse lines had actually been remade at least twice. So this is a lot of duplication of efforts. And um, they also found that only 12% of those were available from repositories. And this is kind of a big deal because uh, you know it can it can actually take several years for um, researchers to create a mouse strain, and it can cost a lot of money. Um, according to the article, feel free to read it. Um, it's um, highlighted here. Uh, it it can take like up to you know can be an upwards of twenty thousand um, dollars. Another uh, study that I want to highlight or situation that I want to highlight is that is the um, Cancer Reproducibility Project. So originally, um, this, the, plant, the goal for this project, this collaborative project, was to um, reproduce 50 cancer research papers in one year. And it ended, up, it ended up dragging out for several years, and they had to put it to a premature stop. And one of the main reasons that they had to stop it, and they, were, it, they had to shrink their study to just 18 um, papers is that they simply could not get access to the um, proper information, protocols, and reagents to even reproduce these results. Um, so these these uh, researchers, they you know they they would spend a lot of time requesting um, uh, from the the you know primary the, the authors. And or they would have to spend a lot of money and time having to recreate those those uh, reagents. And so, so this slide is just kind of going through the problems for both requesting researchers and the people who want to share those reagents. So, for requesting researchers, they have to wait to receive the reagents, um, or sometimes they have to recreate it themselves. And in that process, they can make mistakes in recreation, and that can lead to uh, wrong results. Uh, for the corresponding authors, if that material or that reagent is very popular, um, they may not have the resources to be able to um, properly track and store um, all of the reagents that they've made um, and to consistently do quality control on all the reagents. Um, and then also, you know, to have to deal with the burden of distributing all the reagents to other requesting researchers. So reagent repositories can be a part of this solution. Next slide, please. And so the, the really, you know, one of the utilities of these centralized repositories is that um, it helps uh, researchers get um, speedier access to materials. Like simply having access to that material is like one of the first barriers. Many repositories also help to authenticate reagents and maintain quality control. Uh, they also help to curate the reagents and standardize the information associated with those reagents so that people know exactly how to use those reagents. Um, and then, of course, they, they help with, um, you know, the, the tracking and the shipping of some of these materials, like, worldwide. Next slide, please. And so there are, um, you know, some things that you can do to improve reagent sharing and reporting on your side. Um, so, of course, Again, the theme of like good record keeping, um, record exactly how you made the reagent. Um, and then also it's really important to authenticate it yourself. Even if you're gonna deposit it with a repository, you should always authenticate it yourself to make sure that it really is what you think it is. 
and um, you know, provide any associated information, publications or protocols are also very important. Um, and then in terms of uh, naming the reagents, I'd say it's helpful to use um, a descriptive name, but more importantly, I think it's important to keep it consistent, just as we discussed previously about um, the data management plans um, and like file naming conventions. Um, but I also think it's important to um, have a standardized naming convention. So I think in, in certain research communities, there are specific ways of, of uh, naming certain reagents or organisms that you make. And so just be mindful of what, what those are. Uh, and then also, you know, it, let's say that you have a very descriptive name, um, but it's like very, very long. Um, one way to, um, you know, and sometimes like simply having a name might make it difficult for someone to know exactly where or how to get that reagent. Um, and so if, if you happened to use a reagent that was, um, that you received from a repository, when you're, you know, in your lab notebook or in your manuscript, uh, you know, make sure to include the reagent's catalog number or the RRID. So RRIDs are research resource identifiers. And this is, they're, they're similar to reagent catalogs, except that they are, um, it's basically like a persistent identifier agent. And this is really helpful because um, it, it helps you keep track of the reagents that you've been using and you know, you know exactly where they came from. But uh, in many cases, there will be associated data with um, those, those reagents that you can easily find through the RID or the catalog number. And uh, you know, when, you, when you're including it in your manuscript, it makes it really easy for someone else to know exactly where they can get that reagent and also find additional information about it. Um, and uh, yeah, and then, you know, one other thing you can do is if you're making a new reagent, you should consider uh, depositing um, your reagents and organisms that you make with a repository. Next slide, please. And so some of the benefits of depositing reagents with repositories is that, you know, uh, repositories are well equipped to help you archive um, the materials. It, reduces the time spent on sending out the reagents. They help with authentication and quality control. Um, but then I also want to point out that, you know, there are other um, indirect uh, benefits. And I wanted to highlight this um, graph on the right, which was a um, study done in collaboration with the Adgene data in collaboration with um, some researchers at MIT. And what they found was that, um, deposited uh, plasmids got more citations than plasmids that were not um, deposited. And if you want to, you know, read more about this, I put the link to the, the blog post um, in the bottom, at, below the, the uh, figure. And so there, yeah, there are also other, you know, indirect benefits of um, sharing these reagents, uh, as well as benefiting yourself to help you stay organized um, and to, you know, archive those those organisms or reagents that you've made. Next slide, please. And so there are many um, reagent repositories out there. Um, this is just kind of a, this is not a comprehensive list, um, but I tried to cover many of the repositories that some of you may have used in your, for your research. And, um, you know, I, I, and I guess one question I do have is, uh, if you want to put in the chat or, or uh, in the sh shared notes, um, how many of you have actually are familiar with any of these reagents, or are there any, um, or sorry, repositories? And how many of you have used repositories um, before? Okay, so see that some people have used Adgene, um, the Zerk, Bloomington, Flystock. I also use that as a grad student or under undergrad. CGC, so yeah, it's, these are really great um, resources. And if you haven't, if you haven't used them, I, um, and you know, are working with a specific organism uh, that is, you know, that the repository exists for, I highly encourage you to check them out. 
um, because they really are, they exist to, to help you share your reagents and to get reagents or organisms that you need for your research. But next slide. And so I mentioned before that I work at AdGene and uh, we're a nonprofit plasma repository. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about AdGene since I know AdGene the best. Uh, our goal is to accelerate science by improving access to research materials and information. And um, we work with academic, nonprofit, and also industry scientists um, who use plasmids and viral vectors. And so we basically help researchers share uh, plasmids with other researchers. And so we store and distribute plasmids and viral vectors. We verify, so we do quality control, we verify the plasmids and viral vectors through DNA sequencing and in some cases some functional testing. Um, we also curate information about the plasmids and viral vectors. So the image you see on the right is just one of our plasmid pages that provides a lot of detailed information, including a plasmid map um, for each of these plasmids. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, we're here to help you get, get the, the resources that you need and also to easily share your, your plasmids and materials with others. Uh, next slide, please. And so in summary, um, you know, sharing increases access and speeds up science. Uh, and then, you know, it's really import, important to record key details about the re reagents you're using because um, just because you share, are able to share something with someone else if they don't know how to use it or they don't know exactly how to use it, it's um, not very helpful. And then, you know, consider depositing the reagents that you make. It improves reagent sharing and reproducibility. Awesome. Thanks, Angela. Uh, can everyone uh, see and hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, my name is April Clyburn Sharon. I um, work in educating uh, researchers on open research practices and reproducibility. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about bioinformatics tools and data sharing. Uh, next slide. So let's start with bioinformatics tools. Uh, this is a section that for some of you is gonna include a lot of new information, uh, especially if you're what I refer to as an infrequent programmer or a non-programmer, um, but hopefully some of it will be handy with you if you've got to reuse other people's uh, uh, work at some point or, or learn how to do a little bit of coding yourself. So throw your questions into the uh, notes and if you know a little bit about this, please add your experience in there too. Um, so this um, topic is important for a particular type of reproducibility, and that's um, what we call computational reproducibility, which is um, essentially the ability to take the data and the code um, from one researcher that they've published to support their paper and to rerun it and to get the same tables, numbers, and figures as the original researcher. So it's sort of a subset of reproducibility. Um, and it's um, actually very difficult to achieve. Um, you can see here this survey from uh, a couple years ago, researchers talking about um, challenges that they had reproducing the results of someone else. Um, but I think the more important thing that we see here is how common it is for people to reproduce their own results. Um, so if you had this experience before, share your experience in the notes or in the chat. Um, I'm sure it's happened to many of you. It's definitely happened to me. Um, so uh, when you are um, facing that issue of not being able to rerun your own um, research, sometimes that is uh, um, because you're not able to rerun your analysis. So we'll talk a little bit about the barriers to rerunning your own analysis um, that will also improve the reproducibility for other people to rerun your analysis. Next slide. Thanks. Um, so there are lots of different uh, barriers to rerunning uh, your analysis. Um, one is an organizational barrier, and that's that your analysis will often be dependent upon a bunch of different things. It might be dependent on a 
uh, data file. It might be dependent on little bits of code called packages. Um, and so when you try and rerun your analysis and you get an error and you try and fix it and then you get another error and you try and fix it, um, this is what people will sometimes refer to as dependency help. Some of your files require other files and they're not organized in a way or managed in a way where they can find them when they need them. Another common barrier is a barrier of uh, documenting what you did and why you did. Um, sometimes you go back to an analysis a few weeks, months, or years later, and it's almost like someone else did it. You can't remember why did I choose to do it that way? Why did I remove that um, piece of data? Um, so these are barriers to your own um, efficiency and your lab's efficiency, but they're also barriers to reproducibility. Next slide. So one of the very useful tools for um, making it easier to rerun your own um, analysis is to use what they call uh, literate programming. Um, and literate programming can help you to document your analysis. And um, all literate programming is, is using two types of code together. One is, is um, uh, code that is for the narrative. So this could be marked down. It doesn't really matter mm -hmm. if you're familiar with um, uh, uh, any of these languages or not. Essentially, you're knitting together the narrative with the analysis code itself into one document. Um, and that allows you to, within the same document, record what you did in terms of your analysis code, as well as why you did it. Um, so that means when you come back to a, um, a, a piece of literate programming down the line, you can execute it um, in sequence and you can be reminded, yes, I did this and then I did this and then I did this and that is why I did it. Um, and it also allows for interactive data exploration within one document. Um, it's nice um, to make these literate programming documents because when you share the document, um, you're sharing that documentation alongside your code. So it makes it easy to share your code. Um, if you're thinking about trying this out for the first time, I highly recommend checking out the Carpentries um, or some of the resources at uh, Jupyter or our studio. Jupyter Notebooks um, are a form of literate programming um, it works with over 50 different languages. Python's the most commonly used one. Um, if you are using R, you can use from R Studio R Markdown with Knitter. So um, if you have more questions about that, um, I'm happy to share more uh, resources um, in the uh, shared notes. Next slide. So for those that have never heard of this, have never seen it before, um, this is just an example of what one particular um, form of literate programming will look like. Uh, so this is a Jupyter notebook. And you can see in the uh, box at the top that you've got a little bit of writing in there. It says, in this notebook, we explore the Lorentz system of differential equations. And this is the narrative part of the document. So this is where you can write what you're going to do and why you did it. And then right below that, there's a little grayed out um, uh, we'll call this a chunk of code, and that is where you can put in a little bit of code that can be executed within the document itself. So it allows you to create this story about your analysis. Um, so that's just one example of, of what a literate programming document could uh, look like. Um, and um, if you want to get started, uh, there's lots of resources, especially in the Carpentries, um, uh, to check that out and learn that. Next slide. Awesome. Um, and uh, Lenny touched on this briefly, but another important uh, way of documenting your uh, research is to document those changes that you make from one file to another. Um, people often refer to these um, uh, different documents as a version. So um, if you're doing um, uh, uh, some coding, um, you might want to think of adopting a version control system such as Git, that's a commonly used one. It'll record any changes that you make to your code, um, what changes were made, when they were made, and by who. So it gives you a version history of uh, your code. 
um, and allows you to see the differences from one version to another. So if you just made a small change, so you deleted, um, you know, a line of code or something like that, you'll actually be able to see the difference between those two versions. And you can, um, if you want to, be able to roll back to a previous version if you find that you've made a mistake and want to be able to go back. Um, GitHub is a social platform that uses Git um, to make it easier to share your code and collaborate on code more easily. Um, if you're not a programmer or an infrequent programmer, it's good to try and think about these best practices, um, even when you're just talking about writing. So version control is built into, for example, Google Docs. It's built into the Open Science Framework. Um, just keeping track of your analysis, whatever type of analysis you're doing, can really help improve your computational reproducibility. Next slide. Um, one of the uh, barriers to rerunning your analysis is um, using different software packages. So um, you can, uh, as you uh, begin to learn how to code, you'll find that people will have already created these little packages of code called software packages that uh, you can reuse really easily and that can prevent you from having to write all of your analysis from scratch. So that's really great. But um, when you, uh, for some reason, don't have those um, organized or managed um, in, in um, a straightforward place, you can get into that dependency how we talked about before. Another problem that can happen is that if a package that you are using in your analysis is updated, it sometimes happens that that update to that package will, will make your analysis no longer work. So we call that a, a version conflict. And both of these are barriers to computational reproducibility. Next slide. Um, so you can think about ways of improving the organization of um, your packages and for your analysis in general. So um, uh, there's a term called your computational environment, and that's sort of just mm -hmm. a fancy word for um, all of the different um, bits of software and hardware that went into um, the, the coding environments, the um, analysis that you ran. And you can um, improve the management of those environments by using uh, managers. So package managers, dependency managers, environment managers, these are just fancy ways of saying a way of documenting the software and the hardware that you used. Um, one good example of a, a package manager that can really help you with dependency, avoid dependency hell, is Conda. Um, Conda can handle the installation, um, and all your dependencies. It allows you to have multiple environments for every little bit of analysis that you might be doing for a different experiment. And um, you should also think about documenting those environments um, using some standard um, configuration uh, files. Um, so when I say document your environment, I just mean um, you wanna create a human readable and machine readable list of all of the different packages that you used in your analysis. Some of the standard ways to do this if you're using Python is by creating an environment.yml or YAML file um, or requirements.txt file. If you're using R and RStudio, you can use CRAN as your package manager and R projects to help manage your environments. Um, and you can document your packages in a file called install.r. And that's just a list of all of the packages that you use. So again, packages are nothing fancy. They're just little bits of, co of code packaged up. And if you use one of these managers, it can improve the documentation and organization of your work. Next slide. Um, so if you are um, you know, an infrequent programmer, just improving your documentation is all you should really worry about. If you're um, doing a lot of programming in your research, you might want to um, level up your reproducibility a little bit and start to think about using what are called containers. So containers allow you to package up into a little portable um, computer everything that is needed to run your analysis. Um, they, they store these in things called images. Uh, you don't need to understand how they work. All you need to know is that um, if you use 
um, a, a container technology such as Docker or Singularity, that allows you to um, create these self-contained packages that you can share with other researchers that have all the code, all the programs, all the environment, as well as any configuration files needed. Um, so the person could take that image and they can run it and they don't need to install anything else. So they don't have to go into that dependency hell that we talked about before. Um, and it also will use just those versions that you use so they won't have any version um, conflicts. Um, so it's just like sharing your computer. Um, for those of you who are infrequent programmers, and this includes myself, um, you, oh, there's Elizabeth, sorry, okay. Um, if you're an infrequent programmer by, like myself, you might not um, want to adopt something um, as advanced as Docker, but you can still leverage the benefits of Docker, this container technology, for computational reproducibility. And you can do this using an open source free tool called Binder. Um, Binder uses these standard configuration files, such as your install.r file, your requirements.txt file, or your environment.yaml file. Any file that a computer can read that says what the um, different packages that you used are, um, Binder will automatically rebuild that environment for you and give you a shareable link. And anybody can do this um, and create these links and share them with their colleagues. And that makes computational reproducibility uh, much easier. I think somebody on there needs to mute. I don't know if that's, maybe that's finished now. Um, okay. So um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is data and code sharing. So if you had questions from the bioinformatics, just make sure you share them in the shared notes and I'll make sure that you answer them. So next question, our next slide. <laughs> Thank you. So what should we be sharing as researchers? Um, we want to uh, share any of the data and the code that are necessary to one, validate findings that we're claiming, say in our publication or in a conference proceeding or something like that. And two, the, um, whatever is necessary to reproduce the results. So other people can um, build upon your research. Um, the other type of data you might consider sharing and code that you would want to share is anything that you think would be valuable to other researchers or to policymakers who want to be able to apply the research that you do. Um, and finally, if you're doing research that's in an environment or is um, in, a, in some way not easy to regenerate, that is also data we want to share because we want to ensure that we're not um, redoing um, research unnecessarily. Um, there are lots of reasons to share. Um, sometimes our funders require us to. Some journals are now requiring that data is shared and now a small number are requiring the supporting code as well. Um, there is um, some evidence that it, it might actually benefit you to um, share your data and code because you might end up having your paper better received and maybe even getting more citations. Um, you also, um, if you share through a repository, what you're doing is preserving long-term access to data. And I think um, many of us have gone back to things, um, old computers, old hard drives, and have lost access to things that um, are not replaceable. So, by sharing your data publicly, you're actually ensuring that it's there for if you want to use it again 10 years from now. So some of the key things to think about are whenever possible to choose open, persistent, and non-proprietary file formats. So these non-proprietary just means file formats that can be opened um, without having to buy a piece of uh, software to open them. So CSV files are an example of an open um, file format versus an Excel uh, file, which is a proprietary format. You want to ensure that you uh, add some documentation to your data and code so that people can reuse it. And we talked a little bit about that already. Um, include all your data citations to the source data because we want to um, consider data sharing. Um, we want to consider this shared data as a first class research object. So by citing, you're signaling 
um, that you do consider it to be uh, an important bit of your research and that you're giving credit to those that sh did the same with their data. Um, and you want to create rich, rich metadata. And all metadata is, is data about your data. So this could include things like what units um, the data is in, how it was measured, um, maybe locations, um, anything that allows other people to understand it um, and make use of it. Next slide. So the reason why it's important to think about data sharing um, to preserve access to data is because we know that when people post links to data that they may have shared in informal ways, such as through a website or something like that, that over time, those links break. And we've all experienced this before, right? We find exactly what it is we're looking for, and then we click on that link, and it's 404, not found. That is, you don't know where that um, data is anymore. Um, and this is a problem in, um, uh, in published papers when the data is not shared uh, properly. Uh, next slide. So what we want to do when we're sharing our data is to use a data repository. The benefits of a data repository is they provide a persistent identifier. Um, one example of this is a DOI, a digital object identifier. Um, and this is just a unique and citable link that um, will last over time. So the data, is re the data repositories, they manage this and they make sure that that link's gonna keep working. So you have persistent access to that data. It's preserved, it's backed up. Um, you can control who has access to it in many data repositories. So if you have some type of um, sensitive data or data that requires people to sign a, a reuse agreement of some sort, um, many repositories will allow you to do that. Um, many of them allow versioning of your data. So if you have an ongoing project, you can post your data and then when you come back to it a year later and you have new data, you can go and create a new version. It also allows you to have some control on how your data is used. Um, that's partly through licensing. So you will choose a license for your data. For data licenses, examples of open data licenses are Creative Commons licenses. This is useful for data or for text. You can use CC0, which means it's public domain. Anyone can do anything they want with it. Or they can use CC BY, which just means you can do anything you want, but you've got to give me my um, attribution. So you've got to say that I was the one who created the data. So if you want to take a look at this guide from the Digital Creation Center and sort of figure out what the differences between different data licenses are, it's a very useful uh, resource. Um, code licenses are a little different. There's um, an idea in um, programming called open source. So open source, source means um, different things depending on which license you're talking about, but it generally means it's uh, code that can be reused by somebody else. Um, there are open source licenses such as MIT. Um, there's a great uh, guide from Carl Broman there who talks a little bit about licensing code. Um, and the Open Source Initiative also has great information on open source uh, licensing for code. Um, so when you're trying to decide what repository you should put your data in, the uh, first choice would be one that might be mandated. So if your funder, for example, says all of your data from this grant has to go here, that, is, that question is answered for you. That's where you put your data. Some institutions will have a data repository, and that means that it comes with some help on campus to um, troubleshoot your work uploading it. Um, finally, there are disciplinary repositories, and they're actually super useful because that is where your colleagues are gonna go to look for the kind of data that you're creating. Um, so uh, a great place to get started is this um, re3data.org. Uh, this is essentially a repository of repositories. It allows you to scan the different types of repositories, filter through them based on discipline, and it can really help you decide where you might want to start to share your data. Next slide. If none of those suit your purpose, you can consider using a general purpose repository that accepts any kind of data. Um, some examples of this, and this is only a few, there are many more, 
um, is Data Dryad. This is a curated digital repository. Um, it's free to post. Uh, oh, it's free to access and reuse, but it, um, it has a fee for um, large data sets. Uh, Figshare has a file limit, but is otherwise free. Zenodo is free and also has a data set limit. Um, but these are all um, regularly used repositories and um, uh, trusted repositories. Next slide. So in summary, when you're trying to think about what the purpose of sharing your data is, um, you want to be um, uh, ensuring that the work that you do is findable, that it's accessible, it's interoperable, and it's reusable. This is what they call the FAIR data principles um, that are a good sort of guide in deciding whether or not you have made your data, um, you know, as, as useful as possible and as reproducible as possible uh, for other people to build upon and give you credit for. So um, get organized, uh, ask some questions in the shared notes. I'm happy to uh, answer them later on. Thank you. Okay, I guess it's my turn. Uh, can you all see and hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, so in the next section, we're going to cover data visualization or data viz because I have uh, really a problem pronouncing that word uh, and the analysis of uh, data. I just wanted to um, give you a quick comment on beforehand. Um, my nine month old daughter is kind of raging around the house. So if you hear some, uh, some crying here and there, it's, uh, I hope it's not going to be too distractive. Um, you may wonder why um, we are covering this section in our reproducibility workshop. Um, so I just wanted to point out to you that um, most of how we remember what we have read from previous papers comes from the figures that you, that you have seen. So if you think back of the last paper that you read and you try to remember what was in that paper, most likely the first thing that you'll think of is that key figure that you saw that really convinced you that what the authors were trying to explain was true or what they were hypothesizing was true or maybe that you don't really buy their um, conclusion at all. So the way that you decide to show your data really becomes part of our collective scientific knowledge and how you show your figures really is important um, for how people will remember. Especially since at the moment it's not common practice to make all the raw data um, of a paper available, we should really all try to uh, strive to be as transparent as possible in the way that we show our findings um, so that the reader, both now as well as in the future, can critically evaluate our findings. Um, you can go to the next slide. So how do you actually make effective figures? Uh, the first thing that you need to keep in mind is that um, with your figure, um, you really want to immediately convey the information about your study design. Someone who looks at your figures should right away understand what you are trying to show. It should illustrate your, important, your most important findings. Um, and most importantly, you should also um, allow the reader to critically evaluate the data. And this really means that it's very important for you to show your actual data. Uh, next slide, please. So where do you start? Um, you should start by making sure that um, you analyze your data properly in a way that's reproducible. So most of us uh, use Excel to analyze our data, um, but regardless of which application you use, it's important to organize your data in a way that um, whoever comes after you and wants to um, analyze the data, let's say they want to reanalyze it or incorporate it into another experiment, they need to be able to understand how you organized your data and how you analyzed it. So you need to make sure that you use re reproducible workflows. And some of the problems with, uh, with your workflow can be avoided if you incorporate macros or dashboards. In, in practice, few people use them or few people even know how to use them, uh, but it really pays off to invest some time into this aspect of data processing. The next aspect that um, I would like to make you all aware of is that Excel tends to rename uh, gene names. Um, you can click on the paper that is linked here, um, but when you copy paste your uh, data set um, that con contains a bunch of gene names into Excel and you haven't reformatted um, 
the format to just showing you text, genes like Sept7 and March1 actually get converted into dates. And so uh, many paper, up to 20% of the papers that show um, uh, gene data sets actually have um, errors in the gene names. Another thing to keep in mind is that the vast majority of papers um, tend to use uh, bar, bar graphs um, in their figures. Um, and this is really um, um, not the best way to show your data, as I hope you will see in, in um, the next few slides. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, so, so you might wonder what the problem is with the bar graph. You, can, you see it in almost every single paper. Um, you probably have used it in the past. So why is it not the best way to show your data? So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide because I think it really uh, drives the message home. If you, show, uh, if you look at um, um, the bar charts um, shown in A here, you can see that um, um, it, this is showing you the summary statistics. And so you can see that the second group seems to be a little bit higher. Um, there doesn't seem to be all that much uh, variation between the groups, but you really can't make any conclusions that go beyond that unless you're able to look at the actual data. Um, so on the right, the four different data sets that are shown over here will end up giving you the exact same bar graph that you see in A, but they, ha they have been made up out of very different data points. So in data set B, um, you can see when you compare the, the actual individual data points, you can see that the second group appears to have slightly higher values than in group one. Let me just turn off my mail here. Um, so you can see that the second group seems to be slightly higher than um, the first group. And this might actually be a difference that you would be interested in uh, pursuing further and actually uh, researching. However, if you look at data set C, you can see that the difference between the two groups really seems to be driven by this outlier point in the second group. Um, so if you would be able to see that in your, in your graph, you might actually want to increase your sample size to see um, if this was really an outlier or if there is a different distribution among your data. In data set D, you can see that um, there seems to be a bimodal distribution between the data points. So there might be an external factor that you did not think about when you were analyzing your data that is driving um, your, your distinction between the data points here. Um, you can also see that the sample size here is not that large. So you may want to increase your sample size in order to see if there truly is bimodality um, or if this was just artificial um, because you had such few numbers. Finally, in the last group in um, uh, chart E, you can see that um, um, the data points in the second group um, are very few, and they really tend to cluster uh, towards the high end of the values that you see in group in the first group. So based on, on this data, you can't be all that um, confident that there is a true difference between these two data points, uh, these two data groups. Finally, if you look at the bottom of this slide, um, I, I hope that you can see that based on just the summary statistics and the p-values alone, you can distinguish between all these different options. So there really is no alternative for being able to see the actual data. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? And just to drive this point home a little bit more, um, I wanted to show you what is called the data saurus graph. I hope it works. Yeah. So um, what you can see on the right here are the summary statistics, um, which if you just look at them, you don't really see anything wrong with them. They, they look normal. Uh, however, if you look on the left, you can see that if you look at the actual data distribution, there really is, I mean, if you would see something like this in a, in a published paper, I, I would really um, doubt the conclusions that are made on, on this kind of data. So there is really no alternative to being able to see and critically evaluate um, the data that underlies um, your hypothesis. Next slide, please. Um, finally, um, just to show you again that your, our interpretation depends on what we see, I wanted to show you um, what happens if you show a bar graph versus, um, versus the actual data. So if you show your data as a bar graph, you tend to make the reader um, a passive observer. So if you look at the bar graph here, um, you can see that um, the second group appears like it is a little bit higher compared to the other groups. Uh, but apart from that, I can't really um, 
make any conclusions. Um, I can't really know whether I can truly trust this data. However, if I look on the right and I see the actual data, I, become, I, mean, I immediately become an active participant um, and I can critically evaluate the data and make my own conclusions. And so what I see here is that the second data set or the second group that um, I thought was higher actually has very few uh, data points to, uh, to support the, um, uh, the conclusion, let's say. Um, and I also see that um, the values of this data uh, in the second group tend to, again, cluster very closely to uh, the high values that are present in the first group. The first group seems to be, um, there is a possibility that they may be bimodal, um, but I can't really um, say for sure because there are very few sample size. Um, in the third group, you see that there seems to be this outlier point um, at the top. Um, so here you may want to wonder if, you, if, you, if this is your own data that you're plotting, you may wonder whether, for instance, anything went wrong in the um, acquisition of this data point, and you may want to go double check uh, what happened, or if, or if not, you can actually increase your uh, sample size to see if there's a different distribution here. So um, again, there really is no alternative to being able to see um, the actual data. Next slide, please. So how do you go about actually choosing the right plot when, you are, um, when you're trying to look at your own data? Let's say you've run a small scale experiment um, and you have, um, you've analyzed, let's say six or 10 um, wild type uh, samples versus mutant samples. In this case, it's best to show the individual data points in a dot plot, which you can see on the left. Um, um, now let's say you go with this dot plot and you go to your PI, you show it to him and you say, look, I think the second group really appears to, um, to have higher values compared to the first one. And your PI says, no, I'm not really sure. It doesn't really look like they are really different. I want you to increase this, uh, your sample size. I want you to repeat this experiment. So now you have um, a medium sample size and it becomes better to show uh, your data in box plots that are sh still showing the individual points. If you, keep, if, you, um, if you keep increasing your sample size and now you have a large sample size, the dots on the graph can become confusing. They can start to overlap. And in this case, it may be better to show your data either in a box plot or a violin plot. Um, they, they are both um, very good and valuable. Um, a violin plot tends to be better if there is a chance that your data is bimodally distributed. Because um, if you would show that in a box plot, and let's say your, your um, data points tend to cluster at the top and the bottom of your, of your uh, values, you wouldn't be able to see that. So in this case, it would be better to show a violin plot. And then finally, for those of you who are really um, hung on using your bar graph, can you still use it? You can, but you need to keep in mind that it's best to use bar graphs for categorical data. So let's say, how many legs did your fly have when it closed? If you have an actual count, you can use a bar graph. Next slide, please. If you have um, chosen your dot plot and you're trying to, um, trying to create it, um, I wanted to share some tips with you for how to create an effective dot plot. So over here on the left is a, a pretty ineffective dot plot. So you can see that there are a lot of points that are overlapping and it's kind of hard to really see how many data points there are. So there are different uh, graphs on the right and they show um, various options to increase the, effect, the effectiveness of your um, dot plot um, with the most effective one on the right and the least effective one on the left. So the first thing that you can do is to decrease your uh, point size. And so here now you get, you get a better view of uh, the individual data points. The next thing you can do is to make your, um, your points semi-transparent so that the data points where, uh, or the values where you have more data points are darker compared to uh, the lighter ones where you have fewer um, examples. You can also use random jitter where you are um, um, kind of spreading out your data points across the x-axis, but you see that there's still some overlap here. So the best way to go is to use symmetric jitter where um, there is um, an internal um, um, blanking on the word, where it makes sure that um, there are no overlapping points and all of the points are spread out over the x-axis. Next slide, please. 
In a second step, um, you can choose to um, emphasize your summary statistics. So on the left, again, we have a pretty ineffective graph where there's a lot going on. Uh, there are many different groups and it's hard to really see. Um, what <laughs> Thank you. Um, the first thing you can do here is to increase the width of your bar graph, um, or sorry, of your graph. Um, and so here it becomes a little bit easier to see uh, the different groups. And you can see that maybe this third group tends to um, have higher values. The last thing to really emphasize um, the key message of your, of your image or of your graph is to emphasize the summary statistics. So here the median is shown in black and to uh, de-emphasize the actual data points, but still show them as shown in uh, example C. Next slide, please. If you want to go further, you can also choose to actually generate interactive plots. And there are two different examples um, linked on the right where you can uh, make your interactive dot plot or line graph. And here you can just upload your own data and um, uh, choose how to make your graph. And then you, you um, can download the, the plot, but you can also make it available to others uh, to be able to interact with it. Next slide, please. Um, if, you, if you choose or if you want to explore some options that you can play with yourself, um, there are many different ones that are shown here. Um, I personally like to use Prism, but there are many different others that you can explore. Next slide, please. Um, should I still continue with this or do you want to keep some time for questions? I guess I'll continue, I'll try to be quick. So um, um, the next section and which will be the last section um, is how you should um, try to design your figures when you're using images. And this is both microscopy images as well as um, electron microscopy images. Next slide, please. So I'm going to share um, uh, eight different steps with you that you can go through when you are trying to make a figure that uh, contains images. The first and, and most important thing is to choose a magnification and a zoom that really emphasizes the key message of your figure. And one thing to keep in mind when you are uh, generating figures for your manuscript is to make sure that you don't confuse the reader and to really stick to um, using one key message per figure. So if you're, if you're adding your different panels, try to look at it and try to make sure what, what is my one key message that I want to show here? What is the, the title of my figure that I will put in my actual, um, in my actual paper? Next slide, please. So as an example, what I'm showing you here is a drosophila muscle uh, where actin is shown or the cytoskeleton is shown in gray um, and uh, the nuclei are highlighted in green. So if my key message is that the distribution of nuclei is affected in the muscle of my mutant drosophila larva, where the mutant is on the right and the wild type is on the left, it's really best to choose a magnification where you can see the entire muscle so that you can really see that there that there is a change in where the nuclei are located. Next slide, please. However, if my key message is that there seems to be a change in the shape of the nuclei, it's better to zoom in on individual nuclei um, or on an individual nucleus and really be able to see where you can really see uh, the outline of the nuclear membrane. Next slide. In the second step, uh, you need to decide whether you want to use color or if you want to stick to black and white. And I'm going to show you several examples and what would be the best way forward um, if you have, if this is your situation. So the first situation is when you have an image that's naturally black and white. So for example, if you have an electron micrograph, like the one shown here, where you have uh, two different uh, nuclei within your muscle, um, it's best to keep this image in black and white. Yeah, go ahead. You can go to the next slide. If on the other hand, um, you are in a situation where color conveys important information about the actual appearance of your, your uh, subject, uh, like for instance, you want to show the difference in coat color between wild type or transgenic mice, or the difference in eye pigmentation or cuticle pigmentation in flies. In this case, it's best to use color. 
in the next situation, um, if you are using uh, immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence, if you're only using a single color, for instance, to show the nuclear outline, um, it's best um, to, in my opinion, personally, it's best to stick to black and white because um, we're able to see more shades of gray compared to any other uh, color. Um, so here, let's say you want to emphasize the localization or expression level of a protein, the morphology of a structure, or many different other examples. Here you can, you can personally, you can uh, choose yourself whether you want to um, uh, stick with the color that you had in your fluorescent image, like on the right, in where um, lamin is shown in red, um, or you can choose to, um, to display this image in black and white. Next slide, please. Um, if, on the other hand, you have multiple colors, um, it's really best to uh, use color. And here I would like to highlight that um, you shouldn't forget that white actually is also a color. So you can choose to have um, one channel shown in white, whereas the other one is shown in a color. Next slide, please. When you are um, showing your image in color, um, it's important to remember that not everyone is able to see all colors and that there are different, uh, that there are people with different um, aspects of um, color blindness. Um, there is a very um, nice way to test whether the image that you've created is, um, is accessible for color blind readers. Um, if, you, if you use Fiji for processing your images, um, you can go to image, color, and then simulate color blindness uh, to see what, your, what the uh, image that you've generated would look like if you have very different levels of color blindness. Um, so I've put on the right, I've put um, uh, for sure never combine green and red because they look the same for people who are color blind. Uh, and then I've put several uh, color blind safe options there. So if you go to the next slide, um, here now you can see what happens if um, I have a cell that where the nucleus is in red and the cytoskeleton is in green. If I keep, if I incorporate this image as is into my manuscript, people who would be colorblind would, would see everything as yellow. However, if I, if I put the cytoskeleton in, my, in magenta, um, colorblind people would be able to really distinguish between the nucleus as well as the cytoskeleton. And then um, one thing I wanted to, to um, note is that when you, when you do have a multicolor image, it often also helps to show the individual channels and to show them in grayscale so that they really show the detail of your stain. Next slide, please. The fourth step is to choose a labeling style. And I'll, I'll try to go over this pretty quickly because I see that we're getting close to the 2 p.m. mark. Um, so um, next slide, please. So the first labeling style that you can choose, and this is really when you want to highlight different structures within your image, is to just use lines uh, that you put on top of your image uh, and then a box below to show, um, to show what the structure actually is. Here you need to make sure that none of your lines are crossing over. Next slide, please. You can also use arrows. They are a little bit less um, um, easy for people to understand because um, they tend to show direction and uh, people can get confused whether I'm, I'm highlighting this migrating cell cluster here, but which way is it, is it um, migrating in the direction of the arrow, in the opposite air, um, direction, it can get confusing. So personally, I, I don't think arrows are a very good way to, to um, show direction in your image. Next slide, please. You can use symbols or letter codes to, um, to highlight different structure aspects. And so here you can see that I've marked uh, the nurse cell nuclei with A, uh, the migrating cell cluster with B, and all the other structures with other letters. I think these are most useful uh, when you are trying to teach um, uh, to somebody else what, these, what the different structures are and where they are. Next slide, please. Uh, another way is to superimpose a color code on top of your image. And this way, you actually are not obscuring any of the, um, the details of your image. You are still allowing the, the person who will see this image to see all of the details of it. Um, but you can still um, um, highlight the key aspects that you would like to highlight. So per, I tend to use this, um, this feature quite a bit. Next slide, please. 
the next step is to make sure that everything, every image that you are using um, uh, has a very clearly visible and labeled scale bar. And this, as you can imagine, is really important because it, it allows the reader to see that the image that you're showing has the same magnification as the one right next to it. Next slide, please. Then you need to write a figure legend that um, can be understood by everyone, even if they haven't read the paper. And an easy way to test that in uh, the next slide is to just as you have made your figure and your, you've written your legend, is to put them together, print them out, and just pass them on to a friend in the neighboring lab um, to ask if they can get the main message from uh, your figure. So with that, we are reaching the end of our, our workshop and we hope that we've, uh, we've shown you or we've given you a bunch of different tools that help you organize your experiments, um, uh, analyze your results, um, and finally really accelerate your science. Um, so with that, um, we hope that you can all come up with one thing that you can do to um, increase the reproducibility of your, um, of your science. Um, feel free to add those to the notes. Um, and we would like to thank all of our uh, previous as well as our current funders, as well as uh, THGC for letting us host this workshop here. All, like we mentioned previously, all of, all of the, the um, materials that we've shared here with you, both the slides as well as the notes are freely available. Um, they can be passed on to anyone, but they can be shared with anyone. And if you would like to host your own workshop at your own institute, please feel free to do so. We have, like Lenny mentioned, we have a bunch of different people who have contributed to this. Uh, so you can, um, you can go to the link that's highlighted here and find out who all these people are. Um, we've had a wonderful team today with people who, uh, who stepped up to put this together kind of at the last minute. Um, so I thank you for everyone. Thank you. Uh, I think, I don't know if we will still uh, try to put some questions here, Lenny, or? I was going to say thank you so much. Nayla, April, Angela, I was going to say that we got so many really good questions in the chat. I just saved the chat again. Um, we won't be able to even answer all of the questions we got. Some people dynamically answered just between each other. Uh, not, not, not the panelists, but just the attendees. So we will be answering them over time in the live notes document we will circulate we don't know the answers to some of these questions because we're not experts in everything right um so we will be circulating it to the wider uh community and reproducibility for everyone so that people can weigh in and as Nayla said we encourage all of you to become part of the community just as you were doing on this workshop itself during our presentations you were answering each other's questions as I said in the beginning, you're now certified to lead these. Um, you have the tools, you have all of these um, slides, and we hope that you'll continue asking the questions in the live doc, the shared notes that uh, was at the bottom of every slide. <clears throat> and as April is reminding us, please, please, please take two minutes. In the chat, there is the link to the post workshop survey and some of you are giving very kind comments in the chat but if you could fill out the survey that really helps us improve we go through all of the responses after every one of these that we do and um, particularly because this was an online one your feedback would be invaluable and i think with that um, we'll probably stop recording and I would love to thank everyone who presented and everyone who attended. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Nella. Uh, Thanks, Lenny. Thanks, all the participants. Thank you for the presentation.